Hi, welcome. Thanks for joining us. My name is Morgan. We are glad that you are here with us at Three Creeks Church. It's our vision to help people find and follow God, and we're thankful that you chose to be with us. Hey, for those of you that were with us this past weekend at the worship night, it was so good to see some of your faces and to worship the Lord together. I think at the end of the day, the best part about it was just knowing that we're not in this alone. So we're thankful for those of you that made the effort to be there. Please know that we are continuing to plan and pray about what is ahead for our church and when we get to meet in person. So we would ask that you would continue to pray with and for us. 2020 has been a year, right? I don't think that needs saying, uh, but I have found myself being even more excited about Christmas than I would be normally at this time. I think I watched a Christmas Hallmark movie maybe three weeks ago, which is super early. Uh, but you may be like me and really excited for the joy that this season brings. And I think even if you're still stiff arming Christmas a little bit, you'll be excited for what I have to share. And that is something that we are rolling out as a church called the Jesse Tree. This is something that my family has done for the last couple of years, and it's honestly become one of my favorite family traditions. What it is, it's a tree that has little ornaments that um, you use for every day in the month of December. My kids get so excited and we take turns about which kid gets to put the ornament on the tree. Each ornament represents a story from the Bible leading up to the birth of Jesus on Christmas Day. And it serves as a reminder, it serves as a, a thing, a tangible thing that helps our family to have these God-centered moments every day in the month of December when it feels crazy and so many things are trying to vie for your time and attention other than the birth of Jesus, the whole reason that we're celebrating Christmas and so we want to do it as a church family it doesn't matter if you're single or you're married or you have kids I think that every single person in every category can use this as a reminder of what this whole season is about so we want to give you a kit text Jesse tree to nine seven zero 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 and we will get that in your hands for my family we have read from the Jesus storybook Bible it's uh, been a great way for my kids to engage with the stories if you don't have one of those let us know we would love to get one of those Jesus storybook Bibles to you um, but then also as well read through the Bible um, read the stories that come from the Bible itself and we'll have all those instructions for you but we want to get that to you soon so that you have a chance to get it set up to decorate it before December 1. We're going to transition now into our time of giving. You will see all the ways that you can give on the screen. We want to say thank you to those that have already given to our church. I know this is a really small thing, but even your giving allows us to do something like this Jesse Tree Project as a church family. Joel is now going to be entering into the message. We are going to be in the return era of the Bible. So here it is. Well, hello and welcome to Three Creeks Church. If you are male and if you are single, I know what you're thinking. Was she single? And the answer is no. She's happily married to me. Uh, thank you, Morgan, for introducing today's uh, service. Uh, thankful for you and hope that many of you will do the Jesse Tree thing with us. We're in week nine of Clarity. And before I get into today's message, I want to say one thing to you that I hope will encourage you. Uh, we set out years ago to be a church that serves our city. We said from the very beginning in February of 2018, we don't want to be so focused on ourselves. 
We want to be so focused on others. We want to serve Gehenna if our church ceased to exist. We want to be a church that our city would miss, even if they don't go to Three Creeks. Well, the last few weeks, you've had a chance to flex your generosity muscle, and you've donated so many yams and so much corn, and here are a few pictures of all the food that you donated. We were thrilled to partner with Grin. They're the avenue through which we were able to serve these families. Over 300 families, their Christmas, their Thanksgiving, it will be better because of you and your generosity. When we give to others, especially when things are uncertain for us, it shows that we really do believe that everything that we have is God's and that he is going to take care of us. If you're somebody who gives financially to Three Creeks, even when things are uncertain for you, it shows God that you believe that everything that you have has been given to you by God. It is his and that he's going to take care of you. Uh, if you are somebody who, you know, you don't give to Three Creeks or you didn't give any corn or yams, uh, maybe because you didn't know about it or maybe because you weren't paying attention, uh, I'm not mad at you. I'm just telling you that this is a church. We're trying to create a culture where we are living generously, radically generously. And so I invite you to be a part of that. Over the next few months, we're going to have more opportunities to give, more opportunities to be generous, to serve. And I just want to invite you to be a part of that. That is the kind of church that we want to be. Uh, there's actually somebody who's brand new to our church who uh, things are very uncertain. Uh, it was to the point where it's like, am I going to get a paycheck next week? The job was in the air. And then the whole holiday food drive thing rolls out and uh, they got caught in a group text where it was like, all right, what does everybody want to do? It's kind of assumed everybody was going to do something. And this person was uncertain if they could do anything. Things were tight at that moment for them. And I just went back and forth. They, they reached out to me and said, you know, what should I do? And I, I went back and forth. I wanted to know that, like, you don't have to give anything to come to our church. It's not the rule. But I saw it as an opportunity to say, hey, I think this would be an opportunity for you to be more generous than you've ever been, to risk it a little bit, and just see what happens. I left it at that and wondered if they would accept the challenge. And then boxes of cake mix ended up at my house because they wanted to be generous. And I'm so proud of that person. God, listen, God loves it when in the eyes of other people, we are recklessly generous. And so I'm proud of that person. I'm proud of you. If you gave, thank you. Let's continue to create a culture in our church where we are generous with what we have because everything we have is God's and he will take care of us. More opportunities to give coming up soon. All right, here we are, week nine of our series called Clarity. In week one, I told you that this is intimidating to me and to many of you, that there's 66 books in here. I know some about some of them, but I don't know a lot about a lot of them, if I'm being honest. I, I told you that I want to break this thing down. I'm going to show you it's one big, beautiful story that people like Moses and David and Joshua and Jesus and Paul, all these people are characters in one big, beautiful story, but a God who loves us so much that he wouldn't let us go. This is a rescue plan. I'm hoping that in December, when we're done, that you will be able to open up your Bible to just about any page and go, yeah, like I know who that is and I I know why they wrote that and I can understand it and I can apply it to my life. I hope that is the case for you as the series goes on. So far, I think the story has showcased our need for a perfect savior. I think it has illuminated the need for Jesus. That's what the Old Testament is. The first half of your Bible, it's just this groaning anticipation period where it's like, and we need somebody to come and save us once and for all. And I assure you that that is coming up very soon as we enter into the eighth era. I'll just give you a sneak preview. Era number 10 is called the Jesus era and everything changes. I, I was trying to think, you know, how do I explain that the Old Testament is this period of anticipation leading up to the point where Jesus comes on the scene, two eras from today, by the way, and everything starts to make even more sense. We gain even more clarity. And I thought about the song Bohemian Rhapsody. I think the Bible is a lot like Bohemian Rhapsody. Like the first half, you push play and you're like, 
what is this? I mean, it's interesting. It sparks my curiosity, but there are parts of this that I do not understand. Like, I do not know what a little silhouette of a man is. I don't know what scaramouche is. I'm even tempted at times to just grab the little dot and move it along in the song to get to the good part, the part that, you know, warranted it winning all these awards. And then, though, like, if you listen to it, if you stick with Bohemian Rhapsody, it hits that part where it's like, Mamma Mia, Mamma Mia, and, and, and the guitar solo, it's like, dun, 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 dun. And, and all that happens, and you're like, yes, like, this makes sense. No wonder why it won all of those awards. That is why the Bible is like Bohemian Rhapsody. You've got to get through the part where it says Fandango to get to the good part where you're like, this is all making sense. Like, what a brilliant work of art. Obviously, the Bible is God's word. It's different than Bohemian Rhapsody in many, many ways. But you understand what I'm saying. We've got to get through Haggai. We've got to get through Nehemiah and Ezra today. We've got to get through a book called Habakkuk in order so that we can get to the part where everybody goes, oh my goodness, this is making so much sense. This is what I needed for all of my life. My life is starting to finally make sense. I I don't know if that illustration lands, but I hope you at least thought it was funny. I hope that you can see that the Old Testament, everything we've been talking about, it's this building, it's this anticipation that, that a perfect Savior is coming. So as we go through these Old Testament books, as we, as we go talk about these prophets again today, uh, I want you to know that in some ways, I'm looking out for you because I believe that we're all gonna be in heaven one day. We're gonna be at a party. We're gonna be with all of these people. And I don't want Habakkuk to walk up to you and say, hey, how'd you like my book? I, I don't want you to be caught off guard. I don't want you looking around going, has anybody seen John? You know, like I want you to be able to say, I loved it and it mattered and it changed my life. I know, I know all about this. Today we're going to be in the return era of the Bible. Last week I showed you on here that, that the people of God were living here for a while. They had a united kingdom and then their kingdom divided and the northern kingdom was taken away by the Assyrians. The southern kingdom was taken away by the Babylonians. While they're over there for 70 years, I think some of you remember this, another king comes into power. Persia conquers Babylon. And under the king of Persia, the people of God have favor and the king of Persia actually allows God's people to come back and re-inherit their promised land. Today, I get to show you a little bit of how that happened. You see, the good news is that there is a return era of the Bible. The good news for the people of God and the good news for me and you is that the story doesn't stop. The exile era is not the end of the story. There's another part of the story to tell. See, they were over in Babylon for 70 years. And I want to tell you how they ended up getting back to the promised land. The the two books that we learn the most about this are the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. It was originally just one book, and they split it up into two. I'm not really sure why, but it was written by one person. And there's really three people in this story that I think that it would be helpful for you to understand. If you're going to read the book of Ezra, or if you're going to read the book of Nehemiah, if you're going to want to dive into this story some more, there's three key characters, if you will, to how this all happened. So the first person that you're going to want to know about is a man by the name of Zerubbabel. Kind of hard to spell, probably don't want to name your kid that, but that was his name. Uh, He's the man. He's actually the first person that leads a whole group of people over. And Zerubbabel, his first order of business, if you will, is to rebuild the temple of God. So he he takes with him all of the, the, the pieces of gold and silver, everything that belonged to the temple that the Babylonians had stolen from the temple when they destroyed it. Zerubbabel brings it all back and rebuilds the temple. Uh, just to show you where this actually is in the Bible, in Ezra chapter 6, 15 and 16, it says that the temple was completed on March 12th during the sixth year of King Darius's reign, The temple of God was then dedicated with great joy by the people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the people who had returned from the exile. And so Zerubbabel is really the book of Ezra. 
and his story is chapters one through six. The next guy actually is named Ezra. Ezra is a scribe. Ezra is a, a, a regarded as an old wise man that knows the scriptures really well. The Bible says that, that God's gracious hand was on him. You know, Zerubbabel, he led the charge to rebuild the temple. Ezra is seen as the person who leads the charge to rebuild the people, to rebuild their morale, to rebuild their love for God. Ezra is the one that comes and he's the teacher. He builds the culture again. And in Ezra chapter seven, it says, Ezra had determined to study and obey the law of the Lord and to teach those decrees and regulations to the people of Israel. And so we see Ezra rebuilding the people of God. That's in chapter 7 through 10 is the story of Ezra rebuilding the people of God. The third person that you need to know is Nehemiah, right? So Zerubbabel comes first. They rebuild the temple. Ezra comes, rebuilds the people, and Nehemiah comes. He sees the walls of the city of Jerusalem have been torn down, and it breaks his heart. And so Nehemiah is a leader who rallies the people, and they rebuild the walls. Uh, Nehemiah 1 through 7 is the story of how they rebuilt those walls. And in fact, let me just read you one verse from Nehemiah chapter 2. This is what Nehemiah said when he saw it. He said, Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. And the next four or five chapters describe how, despite opposition, they're able to do it. So this whole era is called the return era of the Bible. They come back, they rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, they rebuild the people, and they rebuild the wall around their capital city. And once again, they have their land. Now you would think that after all of these lessons of all of the judges, all of the, the kings, that you would think that at some point these people are gonna come to their senses and just trust God, follow him, do what he says. <laughs> their kingdom is divided. They're taken away by the Assyrians. They're taken away by the Babylonians. They're they're, it never goes well when they, want to, when they just do what they want to do. You would think that they would have the common sense to go, that didn't go very well. But once again, the book of Nehemiah ends and it seems as though their spiritual state remains unchanged, that they still have hearts that are prone to wander and they still want to do things themselves. This just proves again that we need a perfect savior. And it just builds this anticipation even more for Jesus to come, the Messiah, the one who's going to come and save us all from sin and ourselves. This is the return era of the Bible. Okay, now I want to take a few minutes and I want to zoom in on a story that happened in this era of the Bible. Nehemiah is actually one of my favorite characters in the Old Testament. I think he's a great leader. I think if you read Nehemiah chapter 1 through chapter 7, then you saw that despite opposition, he was able to rally these people to rebuild the walls of this city. I think you'd agree with me that he is a fascinating character in the Old Testament. I want to tell you a story, though, about Nehemiah chapter 8. Essentially, what happens right after they have their wall around Jerusalem built. And as I tell this story, the reason why I feel like God wants me to do it is because what happens to them is what is happening to us in this series. What, what happens in Nehemiah chapter 8 is unbelievably similar to what, hap what is happening to us, what we're experiencing as we go through clarity. And let me show you why. If you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, uh, I'm going to just go through 11 verses today. And so turn to Nehemiah, turn to chapter 8, and let's go to verse 1. If you need to pause this video right now to do that, that would be good. Let's get everybody together. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1. And I'm going to go through one or two verses at a time and explain what happens right after they build the wall. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1, it says this. All the people assembled with a unified purpose at the square, just inside the water gate. 
they asked Ezra, the scribe, you remember him, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given for Israel to obey. So on October 8, Ezra the priest brought the book of the law before the assembly, which included the men and women and all the children old enough to understand. So this book, this book of the law of Moses that's being referred to here in verse one, it's the first five books of your Bible. These are the same documents that are pulled out by Ezra the scribe. So they get all the people together, everybody that's old enough to understand, all the men, all the women, all the kids that, I don't know, 12, 13 years old and up, anybody who can understand, they're all standing there outside of the water gate wondering what Ezra is going to say next. They've watched these walls come up. They're eagerly anticipating what they're going to do next. And Ezra pulls out the scrolls, the rich people, the poor people, the old people, the young people, everybody, men, women, children. They're all there and they're waiting to hear what Ezra has to say. And look at what he says. He faced the square just inside the water gate from early morning until noon and read aloud to everyone who could understand. All the people listened closely to the book of the law. Now, I, I'm trying to put myself there. I, I don't know about you, but I am, not, I am not a very good audible listener. Like Morgan will read something and she'll say, hey, listen to this. And I'm like, listen, if it's more than 10 words in a row, I am going to be zoned out. I think I have a mental issue. I, I, I have a hard time just listening to someone read. But for some reason, I believe by the power of God, all these people are standing there from sunrise until noon. So maybe six hours or so, they all are standing there listening to Ezra read the book of the law. Have you ever opened up the book of Leviticus chapter one and just started to read? Try it and see if you can go six hours. By the power of God, these people are able to stand there and listen to Ezra go back through this law. They haven't heard this in forever. It's like somebody opening up the Bible for the first time in 10 years. They haven't heard this stuff. And so they're just hanging on every word that he has to say. And it goes into even more detail about what he says. Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform that had been built just for this occasion. To his right stood Mattiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah. To his left stood Padiah, Mishael, Malkijah, Hashum, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. Ezra stood on the platform, the one that was built for this occasion, in full view of all the people. When they saw him open the book, they rose to their feet. I mean, again, I'm just trying to put myself there, right? I'm just trying to imagine what that was like. They built this huge wooden platform just for this. And Ezra standing up on there, there's six guys to his right, six guys to his left. All of those names, I don't know if they're pronounced that way. I just gave it my best shot. But my point is this, is that these guys are legends. I mean, people know these guys. And when this story was written in the Bible, all you had to do was write down their first name and everybody know who they were, right? It's like saying Beyonce and Tiger and Usher and Prince were up there. Like you don't even need to know their last names because you know who these people are. I mean, you look up at Ezra, the scribe, the one that everyone reveres. You see these six guys on his right, these seven guys on his left, and you know they're about to say something important. These guys don't build a platform and stand up there all the time. This is a marked moment in the history of Israel. Let's look and see what Ezra says. Verse six, then Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people chanted, amen, amen, as they lifted their hands and they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, I'm not gonna read all those names, but there's a bunch of them, then instructed the people in the law while everyone remained in their places. They read from the book of the law of God, and clearly explained the meaning, providing clarity of what was being read, helping the people understand each passage. So apparently Ezra starts off by reading this and then he brings in some fellow teachers, the Levites, to help him. And they begin to clearly explain to these thousands of people 
the truth of God's word after all this time. This is the first time they're hearing this stuff. And they're explaining it. And it says that they clearly understand it. And people are finally understanding the passages. Have you ever read any of this and not understood it? Well, that's not the experience that these people are having. They've experienced not understanding it. But finally, the light bulb is coming on. And they're finally understanding what this means. As we've gone through this series, I've, I've tried to break this down. I've tried to make it clear. I've tried to go slow enough for you to process everything that we're talking about. We're even going to a map. I'm trying to show you visually that, you know, Adam and Eve were over here and Abraham lived over here and came here and Egypt's down here. I'm trying to show you all of this so that you can read this and understand what the passages mean for the first time in your life. The question that I have, if I'm reading this story for the Israelites is how are they going to respond? How are they going to respond given their fresh understanding? And I ask the same question to you as we go through this series. How are you responding? As things become clear, as you have this new understanding, how are you responding to it? Well, let's see what the Israelites do and see if they do it right. Verse 9, then Nehemiah another one of the main characters that we've talked about. He's the governor. Ezra the priest and the scribe and the Levites who were interpreting for the people said to them, don't mourn or weep on such a day as this, for today is a sacred day before the Lord your God. For the people had all been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. They were weeping why were they weeping? They were weeping because they felt exposed. They felt dumb. Like, how did they not know? They, they realized that they weren't as spiritually mature as they thought that they were, and so they wept. They were weeping. And I'm not sure that you've had a moment in your group where you guys have been weeping. Maybe that's happened. I don't think that it has. But hasn't there been a moment in this series that you have felt like them? Whereas you heard the words of God that you felt exposed. Any Aiken, confession of sin, anyone? <laughs> or the whole what ifs or even ifs thing? Did anybody else feel exposed by that? I know I did. Maybe as this series has gone on that you've felt dumb. Like you're like, how did I not know that? How does everybody else in the room seem to have known that? But you don't know. Maybe you've realized that you're not as spiritually mature as you thought that you were. Maybe you can relate with this group of people that starts weeping. And Nehemiah and Ezra, they go, wait, 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 wait a minute. Now you know the truth and you feel exposed, but you're weeping? This is a sacred day. This is a special day. This is a, this is a day for God. He's moved in your life. Why are you crying? And, and look what Nehemiah says. Nehemiah continues, go and celebrate with a feast of rich foods and sweet drinks and share gifts of food with people who have nothing prepared. This is a sacred day before our Lord. Don't be dejected and sad for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah is going, don't be sad. Don't be dejected. I, I know that you feel like you've been exposed and, and there might be some changes that you need to make, but listen, step one is just going, now we know. I mean, how good is this that now we know? We're not supposed to just spend all of our time discouraged and weeping because we used to not know. We're supposed to be excited that now we know. Now we finally understand. Now we can grow because of it. Nehemiah is going, get the rich food out. Get the sweet drinks out. Somebody order Donato's and somebody get me one of those lemonades with the, the actual lemon that just got squeezed in it. I love those things. This is supposed to be a party. We're supposed to be celebrating every time we're together that God is teaching us new things. We're not supposed to only feel discouraged and sad and convicted. We're supposed to feel thrilled that the word of God is being shown to us. And now we know the Levites they echo Nehemiah. Look at the last verse I'm going to read. The Levites, too, quieted the people, telling them, Hush, don't weep, for this is a sacred day. So the people went away to eat and drink at a festive meal, to share gifts of food. And listen to this. 
and to celebrate with great joy because they heard God's words and understood them. You guys, they heard God's words and they understood them. That's why they threw a party. We as community groups, as we go through this series, we're just supposed to be throwing party after party after party with rich foods and sweet drinks because we've heard God's words and now we understand them. Can anybody else relate to this? I mean, as I've studied this, I mean, I, I knew, I, I knew where this series was going. I, I laid the whole thing out. I, I read this book and it broke it out into 12 areas, but I'm just telling you, as I've read this again, I'm going, man, I feel dumb. How did I not know that? But the appropriate first response when I learned something is not to feel dumb and not to try to hide that I didn't know it. It's to go, now I know. Now I know this is cause for celebration that I have learned God's words and I have understood them. I, I wanna share one final story with you. I have been very embarrassed to tell this story. I, in fact, at one point I just decided I'm never telling anyone this story, but I feel like I have to because I think it illustrates this point so well. Uh, about a year ago, uh, I, as a homeowner, did something very dumb. I walked into my basement, and on the ground, I saw this metal pipe. Now, my basement, it's kind of funny because it's an older home, and there's a lot of things in the ceiling of my basement that doesn't work anymore. Like, it used to serve a purpose, but it doesn't anymore, and nobody took it out, like phone cords and old pipes and stuff, and I'm just not a very great homeowner. I don't even know what half the stuff is, and when I walk down there, I see this, you know, pipe on the ground. I'm like, who put this here? I didn't even realize at the time that it had fallen from the ceiling. I'm like, who put this here? And quickly, flippantly, and foolishly, I just grabbed it and I put it in the trash. Well, I did not know that hot water heaters need vented. I did not know that carbon monoxide comes out of a hot water heater and it needs vented to the outside. This pipe that was on the ground had originally been kind of hanging in my ceiling and it was the vent for my hot water heater. And it kind of shot over to the wall and into an old chimney and out. Well, I didn't know that. So a few months later, it was really cold. I noticed it was really cold in the basement and it's because water or air was coming through that chimney and into the basement. And I kind of walked over there and noticed that the breeze was coming from this hole. And so I thought to myself, I wonder how this hole got here. So I went and bought a bag of quickrete and I'm going to go and kind of paste it up there and fill in this hole so that no air comes into my house. I just think I'm doing the right thing. I don't know any better. And I had a friend come over who knows a lot about homes and a lot about construction and building. He's, he's a great friend and we walked down there. He was going to help me out with this concrete thing and a few other things. And he looked at my hot water heater and he said, where's the vent to the hot water heater? I said, I don't even know that there was supposed to be a vent to the hot water heater. He goes, well, you need to get a vent for the hot water heater. And I, he said, there's carbon monoxide. There's poison that's leaking into your home because you don't have a vent. And it, it, I started to think about it. I'm like, my, my kids' rooms are literally just above where this hot water heater is at. Poison is leaking into my home and could potentially kill us. And I didn't know. So we went to Home Depot and we got all the stuff and we got a new pipe and we got the little thing that fits on top of it and we took the quick greet that was still wet in the hole and we yanked it out of the hole and we, we revented my hot water heater so things are, are, are right, they're safe. Things are, are how they're supposed to be. And now poison is no longer leaking into my home. And in that moment, I was just ashamed. I'm like, I am the worst dad in the world. I'm the worst husband in the world. I'm the worst homeowner in the world. I was sick to my stomach at just the thought of what could have been. I, I cried because I was just so sad at my own. I was just so ashamed, frankly as to how little I knew. But the reality is, in hindsight, that the information that my friend Tom shared with me, the information I now know has saved me, right? Like the information I now know has saved 
me. And so if there's anybody who's going through this series and you're maybe embarrassed as to what you have not known, I just want you to know that this series, as we go through it, if you learn more things, it is cause for celebration. It is not the time for us to be ashamed of what we didn't know before. It's time every week for us to go, now we know. Now we know. And the information that we now know can save us. It can save us. And it's not just an information. It's a person. It's the person of Jesus. Like, what, what he did for us, it can save us. Like, if you did not know that before this series started, you don't have to feel bad about that. If you did not know about Achan or about idols or about worry, if, if these things are new concepts, like, that is exposing you a little bit, if you feel dumb a little bit, I just want you to know, this is not cause for you to be ashamed or worried about what other people think or start comparing yourself and go, hey, I'm never gonna get there. You guys, it's time to party. It, it's time to go nuts because now we know. Now we know. The information that we are now beginning to know can save us. It can save us when we take this information that we know and we can put our personal faith in Jesus who went to the cross for me and you who died and rose again. In the same way that my, my friend Tom loved me enough to tell me that I needed to vent my hot water heater, I love you enough to tell you that you need Jesus, that you need Jesus so that poison does not leak into your home and into your heart for the rest of your life. I, I want you to be saved because Jesus did that for us. If that's new information for you, don't be sad. Let's party. Give your life to Jesus today. Let's throw a party because now you know. Three Creeks, I love you and I'll see you soon for week nine, era number nine next week. See you later. Hey, thanks for being with us today. We hope that you learned something, that you have grown through this, whether you just want to celebrate that on your own or with your community group that you were with maybe today as you watch this. Um, there's a joy in God teaching us through this series. Hey, as always, if you have any questions, we would love to answer them. All that information will be on the screen and how you can do that. And we look forward to seeing you next week.